to me, tennis is one of the most zero-sum games I know. There's this superficial layer of friendliness and civility, but damn, it's like once you get below that, it's very competitive. Yeah, I've been on tour for, I don't know, close to 20 years now. There, there are very few people who I feel like I have a, a deep, genuine friendship with mm. because there's always that layer of tomorrow I'm going to be doing everything I can to take food off your family's table. And that's actually that's one of the things I've struggled with the most in, in sport. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Win Win Podcast. Today is an extra fun one for me because I'm speaking to professional tennis player Marcus Daniel. Marcus is a multiple Grand Slam quarter finalist. He's also an Olympic medalist, winning the bronze medal in the men's doubles at last Olympics in Tokyo. And last but certainly not least, he is the founder of High Impact Athletes, an incredibly win winny movement of sports stars who use both their voices and platforms, but also their own money to donate to highly cost-effective charities. So as you can imagine, we have lots to talk about. We actually spend a lot of this conversation digging into the many sort of similarities between the pro tennis world and the pro poker world. We also hear about the many pressures that the tennis world is facing in this modern day age of technology, social media, and shortened attention spans. And last, but certainly not least, we hear many of his insights into how we can harness the power of seemingly zero-sum sports and turn them into clear win-wins for the world. So all my favorite things, let's dig in. So Marcus, what I'd love to dig into first of all is understanding what sort of strategies pro tennis players use to, in, you know, to ensure peak performance. Uh, like when I, when I played poker professionally, uh, I got a mental game coach for a little while. And because poker is such a sort of noisy game, there's so much luck and randomness. It seemed like the best type of mindset you, a poker player can adopt is one that is just focused entirely on process and not really looking at results. And I remember even developing like a mantra that I would say to myself before a big tournament. It's like, focus on your process and the results will take care of themselves. So does that relate to tennis at all? Like, is there much, like, do, what's your pregame process before a big match? Yeah, I, I think there are huge similarities. Uh, and I think, I imagine in any sport, it would be the same thing where uh, as soon as you get, results focused you get out of the present moment and if you get out of the present moment then it's much harder to perform because mm -hmm. you're not you're not there um my my pre-match routine is probably quite different to a lot of people's because i i always found i i got over aroused too easily and so i needed to try and bring myself down so what i would actually do is about 30 minutes before i'd go out, go out for a match i'd do a five minute meditation and mm. and try to really sort of sink into my body that same concept of not being future thinking not thinking okay what's going to happen in the match how am I going to deal with things that happen in the match rather coming back to the present coming back to my body and saying okay what am I feeling right now what's going through my head right now and just sort of sinking into it and I found that that helped me hugely. Are nerves quite a big problem for tennis players in general or is it it really varies from person to person? Definitely and Actually, another thing you said there, like, so with poker, you've got luck and randomness. I think in tennis, the luck element's probably a lot smaller, but the randomness is huge because you've got a person on the other side of the net who's, who's giving you whatever they decide to give you in the moment. Um, so, yeah, you, you have to be able to deal with randomness. And so, again, going back to that, that process piece, like, how do you deal with that randomness? How do you deal with being in the moment and, and you know, being in that flow state where you don't have to think about your responses because you don't have time to think? Um, that's another piece where, you know, if, if you're in the future, then uh, you're, uh, if you're in the future, then you're thinking too much. And if you're thinking too much, then your body can't react the way that it should react if it's just like that, that natural flowing thing. Do you have any ha hacks to get you into the flow state? I'd like to say yes. But in all honesty, I have various protocols that I use if I feel that, that I'm not in the flow state. Um, 
one that I've really enjoyed more recently is, um, especially if I, f- if I feel nervous, which like it, it's so normal. It, it, it must be the case across every sport, across everything competitive that you get nervous. And if you're not feeling nervous, I, th- I think that's right. a sign that you either don't care or the stakes aren't high enough. Mm. Um, for me, I really like uh, focusing on a specific body part. So in tennis, uh, the thing that's an absolute killer is if your hands and arm get tight because power relies on on fluidity and, and sort of like a whip mechanism mm-hmm. and you can't get a fast end of the whip if you're, you know, your arm being sort of almost the end of the whip, the, the end of the racket being the end of the whip. If the arm's tight, the racket can't move fast. You mean like the flexibility through the wrist? Yeah, so you, your arm always has to be loose and flowing. And if you're nervous, then you get tight. Right. Yeah, and you try and grip harder. So I try to take my attention to the part furthest away. So I try and think like, what am I feeling in my feet right now? Like, mm. is it hot? Is it cold? Are they sore? Um, are my feet tired, stiff, that sort of thing? And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Do you actually do that in game? Like you're caught, like you, in between a point? You... Yeah, yeah. But between points. So yeah, that's that's one thing. Another is um, is breathing. Like, you know, I think that's a, a very typical thing with the whole meditation piece, but like really focusing on breath, not only as a way to sort of recenter and take your, your brain away from being nervous and being tight, but also to recover. Like you do have a, a limited time between points to try and get back to baseline and, and that's part of it. So you mentioned there's a difference in your mind between luck and randomness. I think that's, I'd like to understand how you define them differently. Because to me, they're often sort of synonymous. Like certainly when I talk about them in poker, I see, you know, there's the randomness in the cards, the cards that you get dealt and the cards that come out in the flop, the turn and the river. Um, There's also the seeming randomness of the way, as you said, like your opponent behaves. Mm -hmm. Is that the differentiation you're talking about here? So like, like what would be an example of luck, I guess, in tennis as opposed to randomness? Yeah. So, so the, the way I think of it is luck would, as an example, be a ball hitting the top of the net and dribbling over versus dribbling back onto your side. So winning or losing a point like that, or uh, what we call a shank. Like if your opponent hits a ball, not in the middle of the strings and it hits like the sides of the racket and then goes in for a winner. Like you can't control a shank. So if it goes in, it's lucky and it goes both ways. And you know, it's, it, I think it's a, a pet favorite of, um, of tennis players to consider every opponent's lucky shot lucky or like shank shot lucky and your own was like, well, I was, was going to go there anyway. But um, so that's, that's the idea of luck for me in tennis. And then randomness is more uh, if your opponent does things that you don't expect in the moment, and that's always happening to some degree. Like you can never fully predict what your opponent's going to do. Um, actually, I wonder, so in tennis you're constrained by, by the lines and the net, but then within that you've got pretty much anything that you can do, including some stuff that's not usually done like underarm serves or you know things that aren't sort of sportsman-like. Um, and I was just thinking that th- those constraints at face value to me are more open than poker with the number of cards that you have. But would you agree with that? Or do you think there's, there's just as much randomness in, in poker? If not more. It's, it's difficult because you're, in theory, your, your tennis is a game taking place in three dimensional space. So you have all that granularity and it's very dependent on physics, mm. right? Whereas poker, the, the design of the game in many ways I mean, there is some physics, like you can, you, like there's randomness that happens, like someone walks past and it creates a draft just as the dealer's dealing the cards and that causes a card to flip up. And that then, happened? oh, that's happened. And it actually happened to Igor wow. uh, in, a, in a really major tournament. And it is, it's very funny. I mean, he should tell the story, but uh, he was getting dealt his cards slight gust of wind from the AC or something made the, 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 you know, the dealer just dealt a little too high and it flipped it up and he was going to end up getting aces I think and in the end he got ace king which is still an amazing hand so they, they put that card away and yes you, you don't yeah exactly that card goes and he get dealt another one and oh. that little tiny thing and then he ended up losing his entire stack and if he had had the aces he would have won the you know the the hand and it was it was just really like unfathomably brutal how bizarre yeah so there's there's that physical element that can happen in poker but I I know it's, it's, it's like very hard to quantify I mean but poker itself like it's a core 
like intuitively it feels to me that on the scale between let's say a game like roulette to a game of chess where there's basically all luck mm -hmm. and no skill to all skill and basically no luck poker lies somewhere in the middle and it feels to me that tennis would be closer towards the chess end i guess actually one one the other aspect of luck that probably doesn't get spoken about enough but is actually it plays a far bigger role in the success of a tennis player is the luck of uh being born in the right country in the right town um mm. with supportive parents with a supportive tennis federation that sort of stuff like that's yeah actually thinking about it that's that's the pieces of luck that will make or break a tennis career rather than winning or losing one point from a net cord type thing Mm. So it's, it's it's almost like the meta game of life, basically. Yeah. Are you, yeah, are you born into the right circumstance? And I mean, to a degree, that's kind of the case in poker. Do you have a, actually, I don't know, because poker is something that has a very broad range of people from very broad backgrounds. And, and so with internet now, I guess. Like on yeah, poker. that's definitely leveled the playing field. Yeah, whereas tennis has definitely got this, sort of had this image of, it's quite expensive, right? You yeah. need to, to be able yeah. to afford the top coaches. Um, I mean, it's not as extreme as something like equestrianism, right? No, no, or golf, but still a reasonably high barrier for entry in terms of sport, I guess. Mm, mm. So anyway, coming back to this, uh, you, you mentioned like this role of randomness and you're trying, so it sounds like when you're playing, you are trying to be as unpredictable as possible for your opponent, right? You're using that that feels like the strategy. I mean, I'm a horrible tennis player, but with a few times I've played, like I do these very basic ass tricks, like, oh, I, I'm going to look in that direction and hit the ball that way. <laughs> like I do that in ping pong. Look, it's the best I got, all right? Okay. Obviously I play against Igor, he's a bit better than me. And like, he's figured that out and has me perfectly. But I assume there must be some degree of that going on, right? Like you want to be as inherently unpredictable, surely to your opponent. Yes, definitely. There's also an interesting situation where if going into a match someone has either a weakness that's just known and it's and it's just the weaker part of their game or during a match uh one particular shot starts breaking down and and always in tennis that's the game is how can i break you down how will you let me know that something's breaking down or you're getting uncomfortable about it and then exploiting those weaknesses so there's an interesting case here where if someone has a known weakness, do you do the annoying predictable route of I'm just going to go almost every single ball into that weakness so that you know exactly what I'm doing. So I try and get into your head being like, nah, I, I know, I know that this is going to break down eventually. Um, so there's, yeah, there's like a, there are intimidation games that you can play in that style as well. And that, you know, there are, a number of people in my head who if I came up against them on a match court that would be the first strategy that I'd go for rather mm -hmm. than pure randomness just to be like let's see what you've got with your weakness today mm. and then if it breaks down great I'm going to keep going there and if you if you figure it out if you if you uh, shore it up during the match then okay need to change tactics and and be a bit more unpredictable but until that happens like it's it's a winning strategy I'd love to understand how the dynamics between players in terms of, because I imagine you're on tour, right? Uh, and you presumably develop very deep bonds with some of the other players who you're seeing on, you know, who are both your competitors, but they're also your peers and contemporaries. Yeah. So I'm really curious to understand how that manifests because in poker, people are often surprised you know, like you're literally being out partying with some of your best friends. You're talking strategies. There's a lot of like idea sharing going on in poker. At least there certainly used to be. But then you'll sit down at the table and you're literally going after each other's lifeblood. You're going after each other's money. Yeah. And poker players are good at sort of separating those two things. You know, there might be a few disagree. Oh, I can't believe you pulled that move on me, blah, 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 blah. But basically there is no team in poker and everyone understands and accepts that as part of the rules of the game. And yeah, I can still be very good friends. Is that also the case in tennis? Uh, I think less so. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because you, you see the same people almost every week of the year, right? Like it's a traveling circus. So you get very familiar with people and for the most part it's very civil and most people are really friendly and you know you, you have to practice with other people like you want to practice with people as good or better than you so at the top that 
that list of people is quite small. So mm. you have to be able to cooperate. Wait, wait, so you're on tour and you will literally be practicing training against your opponents. Yeah, it'll be a mix. Like, usually when you're on tour, you do most of your practice uh, with opponents. Like, you know, you'll, you'll book an hour and each side will have their own coach and be working on their own stuff. But to have the, the quality of tennis ball on the court that you'd face in a match, you need to have someone who can, who can produce that. And that the amount of people in the world who can do that are very small. Wow. Um, and then when you go off tour and you have like a week or two weeks of a training block before you go back on, that's when you're with your coach doing drills and reps and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, so there's this, to me it feels like there's this superficial layer of friendliness and civility but damn, it's like once you get below that, it's very competitive. And one of the reasons I was sort of excited to, to talk to you is I, to me, tennis is one of the most zero sum games I know because for me to win, you have to lose. Like mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is pure in that sense. Um, and I... There, there are very few people yeah, I've been on tour for I don't know close to 20 years now there, there are very few people who I feel like I have a, a deep genuine friendship with hmm. because there's always that layer of tomorrow I'm going to be doing everything I can to take food off your family's table hmm. which is weird like that's that's so weird but that's just the reality of it and I think the only unencumbered friendship that you can have is with a doubles partner because then you are literally on the same team and it's both of you trying to take food off everyone else's right. table um and that's actually that's one of the things i've struggled with the most in in sport is that um like it is inherently selfish and and cutthroat and part of me really likes that and likes the competitiveness and like the the fire that you feel from it and another part of me uh feels a bit yuck about it and it's not the type of person that I want to be in life you know mm. and actually so earlier I mentioned you know meditating um, before matches and for the last six or seven years part of that meditation like I, I did some work with with a sports psych in New Zealand part of that meditation was consciously putting Marcus the human aside and saying okay this is who I want to be. I'm going to put you to the side and get into like Marcus, the competitor while I'm on the match court, like more sort of like wolf like tendencies, you know, like right. real fight. And that's who I have to be to win tennis matches. And then afterwards having a conscious sort of transition back to, okay, I'm going to leave asshole Marcus <laughs> on, on the tennis court now and, and go back to who I want to be in life, which is, it's quite a weird, um, mm thing to know that you have to do to succeed right, like literally having to fracture your personality and and yeah put aside your your your, your kinder tendencies essentially to get that killer instinct yeah yeah because i mean that's that's actually a really interesting point you say that tennis is the most zero-sum game because i was when you said that i was like no 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 poker surely is more but actually when it comes to things like friendships because on the poker tour you have the pros but actually the pros aren't, it, it, they rarely are trying to feed off each other. We have this whole other f group of fish in the pond, literally we call that, you know, they're right. called fish, right. the amateurs who also enter the, the things. And they're really what, who you're, we're, we're, we're trying to feed off. And that gives space for pros to actually be more collaborative, truly. And if you've made it to the top table, then like... Well, yeah, the final table, because I mean, this is, I mean, this is in tournament poker, but in, yeah, it, it's usually a mix of pros and amateurs because it's just, there's, again, there's randomness in any given tournament and sometimes the worst player wins and sometimes the best player loses. And, but on average, the better players make the final table yeah. more often. Yeah. So yes, typically the cream rises to the top and you'll more often be up against other pros who might be your friends. Um, but there's still, it, it, I think that allows it for deeper friendships to develop because the in, a there's greater incentives for for actual like sharing of information and and having essentially a team and collaborators uh, uh but b there's just more abundance mm. whereas with you guys there's like real true strict scarcity and it's knockout there's from one the start trophy of the exactly yeah. yes it's, yeah. it's 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 very much like that there's not like just a bunch of random amateurs also in there who you're you, you're taking from it's just yeah. you guys and there's a smaller number of you right yeah. how many people's in an average tournament 
Uh, usually 32 singles players, 16 doubles teams mm. in, in the average tournament. Grand Slam's much bigger. One question for you, do you prefer to play against professionals? Like, is it is it the case that because amateurs don't know what they're doing so much, because they're so unpredictable, it's harder and less fun to play against them? Whereas if you're against equals, it's like, okay, now we've got a, a real poker game on our hands? Um, mm, no. So you, generally speaking, the reason why an amateur is an amateur is because they just make worse decisions in in every in every spot okay. on average their decision making process is less good and the more decisions you get to make against them the greater your edge you know those 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 that delta between mm. their bad decision and your good decision adds up mm -hmm. and so typically you just want to while it's true that like real beginners play so crazy it's sometimes hard to get a read on them if you know what the like mathematically optimal plays are then you just you can just follow those and ignore Over all the time, crazy yeah. shit they're doing and you're yeah. they're just gonna be making so many mistakes that you can just play like pretty abc and you'll just be mm -hmm. still extracting um now that said it can be a nice challenge like if you're playing against a bunch of players who are just so bad but they're also predictably bad that i could see that getting boring and so it's nice to have better players to play against so that you can actually improve your own game so coming back to your I think it's really interesting you mentioned like this this idea of having to separate these two parts of your personality to sort of isolate the the cutthroat killer. Do you did you find that became easier or harder to do as you got older? Like did you become more or less like classically competitive in that respect? It's like I must win and ruthless in your competitiveness. I think it became harder because at first I didn't think like that. Like when I was coming up through the levels, I just wanted to get through the levels. Like it, I, I wasn't making a living from tennis. I was losing money playing tennis. Um, it was like, how do I keep the dream alive? How do I actually make a living from the sport, from something that I'd already, you know, dedicated 10, 15 years to? Um, so at that stage, it was just like, no, I, I need to do this. Uh, and then I think it was only when I'd started uh, feeling a bit of security in tennis that I started having these thoughts of, oh man, I'm like, I'm playing against guys who had families and I knew their families. And I was like, oh man, that's like, they've got two really cute young kids. And like, you know, if they lose, then he might drop outside the top hundred. And then I don't, is he, does he have to quit? Like, how's he gonna keep providing for his family? Like that sort of thing. Um, that only came later on. And so, yeah, I think, I think actually it became harder later and I definitely put more work psychologically into, into what I had to do to try and like separate or it wasn't even that that was the result of the work was like, okay, what do I have to do to feel comfortable doing this and, and winning? Because I, I even tried for a while um, in my mid-20s uh, completely removing the opponent from the, from the situation. So... Don't think about the opponent. It's a faceless, formless blob with a tennis ball coming out of it down the other end. Purely play the ball and play to the best of my ability, disregarding everything else, which is a beautiful idea, right? In practice, I didn't win a match for like three or four months. And the, the main reason I can think of for why that's the case is because of how cutthroat it is. Like at a certain level, you win and lose tennis matches based on the tiny little chinks in the mental and emotional armor of your opponent. And if you're not paying very deep attention to, to those things, the little tells that you can see in your opponent, and you don't exploit them as they come up, then they've got a chance to regroup and it just becomes a whole lot harder. And that in itself was quite, like, quite a painful realization that I win tennis matches based on like doing everything I can to upset you emotionally and mentally. And it's not just about the tennis game. You know, maybe Roger Federer could make it just about the tennis game and, and still win everything. But yeah, like for me, it was like, okay, well, I, I have to be that person to like really focus on weaknesses. And, um, and yeah, then that led to the, okay, if I'm sort of the acceptance, like if I, if I have to be that person, then at least I should try and not bring that person into my day-to-day -day life. 
Yeah, it's kind of like, it sounds like kind of like a war game where in many ways a strategy that military generals seem to do is they, they, they want to dehumanize their people so that you can you can channel your inner psychopath basically to be yeah. okay with the you know this what you're doing to them essentially what you're taking from them but actually that also comes at a strategic cost by the sounds of it because then you're you're almost like you're you're dehumanizing them so much you're losing touch of your own humanity which is noticing how your other human is reacting like i think the the opposite end of that spectrum is some people really lean into the the opponent is the enemy mindset and you know will be like swearing at you under their breath the whole match and like just it's it's truly combative rather than a sport competition it's like you know like yeah quite nasty uh but i can definitely understand how that helps people win because it's like is that something all the top players do no no i don't think so at least not explicitly um like there, there are people who've had extraordinary careers who I've never seen uh, like overt tension or like... Hatred. Yeah. Like the two that come to mind are, are Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal. Insanely competitive people, both of them. Nadal, you can see it probably more than, than with Federer because just the way he walks around and like his facial expression. But man, the the few times in Federer's career, especially his later career, that that he got frustrated with how a match was going and it slipped through the cracks, you saw just like a volcano of competitiveness in there. Um, and, but yeah, they it was like, so that there was something in there, but they, they never used it as a tool on their opponents. At least not explicitly. No, or not often. And I think actually, I'm not sure if this was conscious or not from Federer, but I remember I remember one time specifically, I think it was at Indian Wells, and he was losing a match and not playing very well. And he was just his normal self, like calm and just like flowing around and looked like he'd just come out of a shower with his hair all done. And it got to a stage where the other guy who he shouldn't have had any business losing to was getting quite close to winning. And point was over and he just screamed, like just unleashed. And you could see the moment that his opponent looked up and heard it and was sort of shocked. And from that moment on, he was, he, he was so shaken because he'd realized at that point, I'm about to beat Roger Federer. And that switched the match. So if it was conscious, it was genius because it's so unusual for Federer to, to have an mm. outburst or anything like that, if he used that as like, a okay, I'm going to release some of this negative energy and I'm also going to get my opponent off kilter, man, that's like locker room power at its finest because then the opponent starts thinking, oh, wow, Federer is rattled. I'm, I'm about to beat him. And it's like, what? I'm about to beat and then Federer? And now they're out of the game. Yeah. And then it's they're like not in the moment. Thing, like, exactly. oh, I'm about to beat Roger Federer. What am I going to tell my girlfriend and my friends? And uh -huh. oh my God, I'm going to have so much attention. And then when you're out of the present moment, like... The game falls apart. It's hard to get back into it. And Federer turned the match around and I I don't, I don't think he lost another game. Might have lost one more game, but but won the match. It's just like, I this is the part of sport that I find so fascinating is those little mental emotional like intricacies that can only exist at the top when technical level is so close mm. yeah it's these little tiny edges have you ever lost your temper yeah yeah it's that's I, th I think it's normal like what's it what's the rate with which like do, do you <laughs> do you lose your temper on average is it like every game because like when i play poker i i would get like upset or we call it being on tilt I, I, in any given tournament, there'll be a moment where I'm like, you know, I'll get my aces cracked or something and I'll feel that like, ugh, this sense of like injustice or rage. Now, how long it lingers is that's what varies, but it's, it's, I don't think I've ever had a time where I was just like completely zen mm -hmm. and was completely impartial to what was actually happening with the cards. Oh yeah, I, I don't think I've ever had a match in my life where there wasn't a moment or moments that I was frustrated. Like that's, I think that's that's 
the beauty of tennis is you can even if you win a match like six two six two, there will still be moments where mm-hmm. you feel the momentum might be oh, switching. Oh, I could have made or, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll never play a perfect match, um, but then there's a difference between that and letting it show. Like, I I think my famous my my favorite uh, form of showing frustration is like just a wordless yell because I I like releasing the negative energy and I feel like often that can actually uh, bring me into the moment. And so it's like positive because you're releasing this negative energy and it's also like a snap back to, okay, what do I need to do now? And, you know, I'm not Roger Federer, but ideally it also like does something to the opponent. Um, And then throwing a racket if I'm really pissed off. But that You throw a racket? Oh, yeah, many times. (laughs) (laughs) But that mm, that now would probably only happen, I don't know, once every 20 matches or something like that. What were you like as a kid? Like how did you have this burning competitive desire from a very young age? Or was it something that as you grew and d- discovered that you were actually just really good at tennis that developed? I think I was always competitive. Um, yeah, I have an older brother which I think helped. <laughs> so Seems it was always, like a common theme. Yeah, trying to beat him. Um, and I was a lot more angry and sulky as a kid. Like, threw my racket a lot as a kid. <laughs> and had to get taught a few lessons by my mum, like, you know, paying for my own rackets and doing chores to try and save up <laughs> and all that sort of stuff to, to rein it in. Um but yeah, I, was, I think I was always competitive and then had to sort of mature into how to rein in the the energy and the negative energy into something that came out as more positive. Mm. It's interesting that you, so you play exclusively doubles now? Now, yeah. yeah. So what, what was the main driver for that? Because I, I, I always assumed that sort of uh, most players would just try, kind of mix and match between the two. Yeah, there's, well, a few explanations. One is I probably wasn't good enough at singles. I never really got to find out. Um, I've had a lot of issues with injury over my career. So when I was playing, I always played singles and doubles. And when I was playing a lot of singles, I never actually played a full season. So so I'd, I'd like get momentum, start building the ranking. Things would start flowing and then I'd get injured. And when you get injured, you lose ranking. And you have to sort of you slide down the mountain and have to start climbing from, from lower down again. Um, so that kept happening for many years. And then one year I was actually playing the best singles I'd ever played. My ranking was the highest it had been. And then it just so happened that during a series of challenges, which is like the second level of professional tennis, the ATP tour and then ATP challenger tour, I was playing singles and doubles in the first event and I lost early in the singles and won the doubles. And then at the event afterwards, I was in the qualifying of the singles and qualifying happens on the weekend before the tournament starts, but I was still playing the doubles final at the other tournament. So I couldn't make the qualifying. And then that happened like four weeks in a row where I couldn't play the singles qualifying because I kept doing too well in doubles. So at the end of this set of four tournaments, my doubles ranking shot up and my singles ranking had slumped Mm because I hadn't played singles for three or four weeks. And at the end of that, I had to make the decision, do I play bigger tournaments in doubles or go and play the smaller tournaments in singles? And at that stage I was mm, 24 or something like that. And I'd had enough of the grind of the lowest levels of professional tennis, which is brutal. Like you cannot make money you're playing in some pretty outrageous places sometimes, like sleeping on the floor, trying to save money while still trying to perform at like a, it's still a high level, like the tennis is still a high level, but the rewards are, are almost non-existent. So decided to focus on doubles from there. And and I guess the third part is my skill set's better suited to doubles. Um, I like coming forward, playing at the net, um, that sort of thing. So yeah, if I'd played singles, 50 years ago, I might have been a very good singles player, but now with the courts and balls the way they are, definitely better suited for doubles. How do you select a doubles partner? <laughs> it's it's strangely like dating. Like, <laughs> like 
it, no, it's even worse than that because it's like dating from a very small incestuous pool of uh-huh. potential partners. Because firstly, there are only maybe 50 people in the world who have a ranking similar enough that you could play the tournaments that you want to play. Secondly, you have to get along with them because you'll spend more time with your doubles partner than with your, your spouse. Like that's like much more time. Um, and then thirdly, you have to play well together. So, right. you know, even though there are, I don't know how many tens of thousands of players trying to be professional in tennis in the world, it might narrow down to a list of like five to 10 who you could play with. And then most of the time, all of those people on that list are already with another partner. So then you have to play this really gross game of like reaching out, being like, hey, just just checking how things are going flat. with, yeah, <laughs> everything going well with your current partner, like just checking in, just letting you know that like, I think we'll play well together. And, you know, you've got to try and sort of like suss out if there's any potential movement or at the end of each year if if one of the top teams like the top teams in the world splits then there's this whole cascading effect of everyone trying to play with a partner who they think's better right and it's pretty gross um and i've always thought that there's too much switching in doubles like i really like the idea of of committing to a partner and building something long term and you know you go through the rough patches and you come out of them better because you've had tough experiences but What seems to be the case is if a tough patch goes even slightly more than people are comfortable with, it's like, oh, it's my partner's fault and switch. I wonder if there's like an incentive structure that could be designed to encourage more like long-term partnerships. Because from from an outsider's perspective, like doubles is not so much, it's not presumably as popular of a spectator sport, right? At least I I, I rarely watch it. You know, when I, when I, I don't, I'm not like a particularly prolific tennis watcher, but I very rarely will watch doubles, whereas I always watch a big singles match. Yeah. And perhaps it's in part because it, like the the doubles, like, do they even have, do you have team names or anything? You don't, right? It's just the names of the two individuals. Yeah. yeah. Whereas if you had long-term, uh, longer-term partnerships, you could actually like the, the two tigers or whatever yeah. name you guys come up with. And something that makes you more like m- identifiable and therefore marketable, which would actually incentivize then players to actually stay together for longer as well. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting chicken egg thing because a lot of people who play tennis recreationally enjoy doubles as much, if not more than singles, especially the, old, the older generations who can't get around a court as mm-hmm. well. So I, I actually think there's, I'm sure I have a, a biased um, sample size because you know I, I ask quite a lot of people about this, like what do you think of doubles compared to singles? And I often hear I actually prefer playing and watching doubles but because doubles is on TV so little, mm. there's not the exposure for the players to, to result in like more interest and result in more sponsor, sponsorship opportunities, blah, blah, blah. So one way of looking at it is particularly if teams stuck together and you could market people as a team, then you could build hype around right. the teams. You can have rivalries. Oh, it's, yes. the, it's the Tigers against the Hawks today. Yeah. yeah. But then the other side of it is it would be a risk for the ATP or the WTA to put marketing spend into something that's not proven yet. You know, like, should we risk however many millions of dollars trying to make doubles a bigger sport when we've already got, already got singles mm. and that marketing strategy is proven? I mean, like, the most famous and most successful team of all time was the Bryan brothers, and they were just a dream for, for sponsors and for the tour because they're identical twins and insanely successful and they always played with each other so it's like a name is alliterate alliterates as well brian brothers the bbs yeah 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 so i yeah i do agree with you i think teams should stick together and and if they did i think they'd be both both for success on court and i think there'd be a lot more success off court if teams stuck together for longer have you ever had like a really notable conflict with your partner there was one guy i played with for a couple of years quite early in my career and great relationship we had quite a bit of success sort of moved up through the ranks together and talking about like known weaknesses his forehand was a known weakness on tour and it got to the stage where in practices and matches I wouldn't see that many shots because everyone would just hit it to his forehand and they'd know that that was all they had to do 
And it got to the stage where there was a definite glass ceiling. And I knew that, so I think we were ranked in the 30s or 40s in the world at the time. And the next level from there, if you're top 30, you can always play the Masters events, which outside the slams are the biggest events and they have the most money and the most points. That's sort of like the highest level you can get to as a as a range. And I, I knew that if we didn't fix this forehand, we'd never get there. And I spoke, he, he had a coach that he was working with. I had a coach that I was working with at the big tournaments they'd both be there and both be like trying to help us as a team i spoke with my coach a lot trying to figure out how to broach the subject of hey we need to improve your forehand in a way that wasn't um negative or blamey uh and was like look at this opportunity that we have but also saying like if we don't then this is it this is the best we can hope for and long story short it led to a pretty nasty conversation with him and his coach because there was just a complete difference in theory of what made a good forehand, which I found incredibly frustrating because from my side, it was like, well, obviously you don't know because your forehand is known to be terrible. So open your mind to someone who's produced a bunch of good forehands, not saying that mine was amazing, but he, he had produced a lot of good forehands, my coach. And uh, ultimately closed minds and we split. Um, but that's, when I, when I think of conflict with a partner, that's the situation that comes to mind because of how uncomfortable it was with the coach and with the player and like not being open to something that was, that seemed so obvious and was like such a drawback and a, and a glass ceiling on, like the guy was such a hard worker and, and so passionate about it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, it sounds, I mean, it's, again, going back to that dating analogy, it's like knowing when to quit. Like that's often, I think one of the biggest f sources of distress of anyone in their life is like, you're in a relationship that's not going that well, but you've put in years of work into it. But if that doesn't work or have results, then what do you do? Yeah, so do you have a, a rule of thumb now? Is there anything from that lesson that you've taken away where you're like, okay, in the future, this is going to be the benchmark or do you, or is it just that you've increased your stringency in terms of selecting a new uh, teammate, new partner? I think that the stringency that I've increased is I, I would never want to play with someone who wasn't honest about their own shortcomings because everyone has them. Everyone has aspects of their game that, are their weaknesses and it's all at different levels like the best players in the world their weaknesses are still really good but they're still mm -hmm. weaknesses and so if if people aren't willing to admit a weakness then there's no hope for improving that and if if that's a weakness that will stop us as a team from getting to where i want to get to then that's a real problem mm -hmm. it's interesting you say that because at the same time there's i would agree that You'd think in a vacuum with any kind of peak performance, you need someone who would critically examine their own weaknesses as objectively as possible and then like plug those leaks. And, you know, we say plugging the leaks in the, in, in the game mm -hmm. of poker. If I know that my weakness is actually these certain situations. I don't bluff enough or I'm like, I get, I get too fearful or I get too, too aggressive. You should be able to critically examine that. But at the same time, in poker at least, there have been some players that seem to have this X factor where they're almost delusional about what you think is their skill level and yet they just keep winning. Or in look at CEOs sometimes. Like there's this level of madness that some of them have where it's like in a in a vacuum, it's like you, you want to start a company that does that and you expect it to grow to this within this amount of time. That makes no sense. Like you run that simulation a thousand yeah. times, that's going to come true about five out yeah. of a thousand or something like that. And yet it's those people are the ones that if you, if they don't have that seeming delusion, they would never try it in the first place. So I'm curious, yeah. like, you know, you take a Nadal or a Djokovic or someone like that. Would you say they, these are all like just deeply objective, classically rational people, or do they have that madness as well? I love this because that guy, the reason he got as good as he was, was because of the delusion. Right. Like the forehand shouldn't have let him get to a ranking that he was at, but because he he was delusional enough about it to like, you know, he missed six in a row 
and after the sixth myth be like yeah okay okay the next one's going in like i got this i was like what no no you don't but he, he literally believed it and that's a bit of a superpower and i i imagine everyone has a bit of that like you, you probably need a bit of that i just it was so glaring with him and it was it it felt to me like it was such a such an easy fix to improve quite a lot that it stuck out but i imagine everyone has an aspect that they have to like almost consciously be delusional about because they're insecure about it on a match court mm. the better you are the less it gets found out but then this is again where where i think tennis gets really interesting is when you have the the very best players in the world playing against each other they're the only people who can find each other's little weaknesses out and then you've got the the mental challenge of how how much can i keep this delusion going and so yeah i, I don't want to get too sort of specific and technical on tennis stuff but like nadal playing federer on clay is there were there were situations in that matchup where nadal could could quite consistently find federer's very slight weakness and prey on it and just stuff like that and like early days of, of federer playing nadal and djokovic on grass like they're just very specific situations where the best in the world could unmask the delusions in their opponents and yeah again it's like those like when it gets down to that level of intricacy, that's what I find really interesting about sport at a high level. Mm. Did the players ever, yeah, but after one of these Federer Nadal matches, do you think they ever sat down and like over a beer and break down the game, break down the match? Probably not what I imagine you guys did in poker. Yeah. Like I, I think there are some some friendships amongst the top guys where they could have a beer together, but because they are just so insanely competitive, I I very much doubt there'd be trade secrets mm. shared. I think it would I would love for a film crew to organize Federer and Nadal when Nadal retires, just having like six drinks together and getting loose and being like, oh. remember this match when you did this, and I would I would love that. So in poker, we have a lot of what we call leveling. It's like, so I, th I think he's going to do this. So I'm going to do that. But actually then he'll most likely realize this. So actually I'm going to go back to that. Do you have that kind of level of strategy before, you know, you're just, you're about to do a serve and you're figuring out where, where to put it? Yeah, particularly on serve. And the, this is, this, I'd, I'd really like to know more about that on the poker side. Cause in, in, in tennis, I think it occasionally goes to the third level as, as I would conceive it where, um, Particularly if someone has a weakness. So let's say you're serving on a big point. Let's say it's like a your break point down on your own serve and you're serving. So you're serving like 30, 40 to the ad side, if that helps to set this up in people's minds. And you know the guy has a weaker forehand return. So he's expecting you to, to hit it to his forehand because it's a big point and you play the percentage plays. But then you you... Often, especially if the match is tight, you want a cheap point off your serve. And so if he's leaning to the forehand, there'll be space out to the backhand side. So you're more likely to hit an unreturnable serve if you go for the wide serve. And then add a layer on top of that, which is what's my favorite serve rather than what's his weakness. That's another sort of level. But then you go back to, okay, well, he might think that I might go for the cheap serve because I haven't had many cheap cheap points on, on my serve yet. So you go back to the forehand side and that level of things is quite common I, like very occasionally might go one level beyond that and go back to the wide serve or like something completely different but yeah that's that's sort of the level that that i think in tennis and i'm just i'm curious with poker how far down the he thinks that i thinks that he thinks that, like how far down do you go it's really hard to quantify i mean again if it feels like three maybe four at most i don't think i ever went more than probably three levels deep in any situation do you guys incorporate a randomizer in in your strategy because like that is a big part of poker huh. it's an essential part of, like to play game theory optimal you it's about knowing the ratios of um how often you should bluff in a given situation and in order to get those you know it's, it's so let's say you, you want to bluff 30 percent of the time in this given situation so how do you know it's that 30% of, 
it's it's that 30 percent time people will look at the second hand on their watch or they'll be playing with their chip and see where the the, the words on it land when they drop oh. it um there's there's different ways do you do any of that that part i've never been i've never heard as anything other than intuitive of oh. yeah yeah that for me anyway that part's always been intuitive of it's we need to change it up now mm. but it almost always it's based on what's happened already of like okay he's leaning a little too hard on this one and so we need a change up to keep him off balance and then we'll go back to something that's that's like a layer below or something like that right because it's the thing is is that human beings are not good at actually doing randomization like if you get people to try and pick you know give give me a string of random numbers between 0 and 100 the the, the types of patterns that people yeah. give actually yeah. aren't very random like like we underdo doubles or triples even um, we always think that numbers have to be different sequentially and that kind of thing. Uh, and which is why I think poker players, we don't trust our intuition to go, oh, that, oh, it feels about time. You know, it's been 30%. We're like, mm -hmm. we just don't do that. We literally use some kind of physical randomizer like the second hand on the clock. Um, so it's, wow. a, it's somewhat, somewhat surprises me that the top players aren't introducing, like, yeah. I, I would love to see you know, someone have a, a dice in their pocket and, and, and like throw it in the air and let it land. It doesn't matter. Like, because in poker, like it, it's actually almost a good thing for your opponent to know that you're randomizing. It, it's not a bad thing because, because it, as yeah, long as your ratios are correct, as long as they're, they're like, whatever your decision, you know, what, what comes up in your randomizer, they, they don't know what that means. It's actually not bad. That's so interesting. I, I wonder if there's room for improvement in tennis for like, a conscious randomizer. Yes. I'm I'm going to experiment with this. Ooh. I'll let you know. I'll <laughs> let you know really how cool. it goes. That's super interesting. What role has uh, technology played in in terms of cuz a like Hawkeye, right, which is the uh I mean you'll explain it better, but it's basically using a camera to look back at whether whether the ball was in or not. Um, that was introduced in what, 2006, around that time? Sounds about right. I mean, now there are many tournaments where there aren't lines people, Hawkeye just calls the lines. Right. Oh, it's so automated. You, yeah, so it's not like lines person calls and then you have the ability to challenge X amount of times in a set. The lines are just called and that's that. Do you prefer that? Uh, I think net, yes. Like I, I do think there's more of a, parade when lines people are involved which i think might be good for the sport yes um but it's a, these drama points yeah but I, but like it's it's cleaner there's no arguing people sometimes ask to see it but there's no point because it's just going to show you that that the ball was out right like you can replay the mark and there's also there's enough margin for error with hawkeye that it can be wrong like you can see the ball better than hawkeye there's two or three millimeters which you know, like it, it makes a difference, um, but there are no disputes because you can't blame anyone. It's just the right. It just is what it is. It's yeah. the er yeah, it's the error, uh, the, the 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 error bar basically on the yeah. technology, and presumably, you know, like I feel like my personality, at least, if I was playing tennis, and I would have ex I would expend a lot of mental energy wondering whether the umpire is being stupid. <laughs> I just feel I I know that that's something that triggers me when there's like a human element and the the human is the arbiter deciding what's what was true or not, and if I think they're wrong, it's going to bother me more. Like if a machine gets it wrong, that if some it's, it feels less personal. Yeah. For some yeah. reason, so I know from my personality that would I think I would prefer that sort of rigidity and even though there is a margin of error and it may be sometimes less accurate than a human, on average it's presumably more accurate than a human being. I think so. Yeah. Has to be. Yeah. Surely like the speeds that these balls are going at and like it's like, yes. I'm sure these guys have good eyes, but come on. And actually sometimes from the umpire's chair it's harder to see balls in or out just based on the angles. Um and, and yeah, like it, I feel so sorry for umpires cuz it's the most thankless job. The best Seriously. they can the best they can achieve is not being noticed <laughs> unless they have a beautiful voice in which case they might get props for that, but I was actually, I was talking to, a, um, I was playing Davis Cup in New Zealand last week and the guy who was the supervisor for the tie, very experienced umpire. And I was talking with him about this and I thought it was quite beautiful actually that he, it seemed anyway, like he had complete contentment 
in not being noticed. Like he had either he truly believed this or he'd con- conditioned himself to believe that if he wasn't noticed during a match or something like that, that was like huge. That was, it was like a beautiful thing, you know, and that's not normal, right? Like we, we want to be recognized for doing something rather than for the absence of doing right. anything. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's like Buddhist, it's like monk mode almost. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought it was, it was cool to hear him say that. And the, the best umpires in my mind are the ones who admit the possibility of them being wrong. What, what infuriates me with an umpire is if they say you're wrong, it was this and end of conversation mm-hmm. because that's not necessarily true and and it's the same like if i say that ball was in then they could say i didn't see it that way and that's like okay well you didn't see it that way we saw it differently difference of opinions that's fine but if they say no i'm right i saw it correctly you're wrong if you're in the heat of the moment and you think that you've been hard done by man it just like ratchets up your Mm. anger and yeah is there any schmoozing of umpires that goes on behind the scenes no it's pretty strictly controlled like, like you the, don't know who your umpire is going to be i think maybe day of the match you, you might be able to see who the umpire is i think maybe it might be on the schedule but um like umpires aren't really allowed to talk to players off court uh, it's very separated and but you presumably can't stop that i mean i don't know how many umpires there are in the world but there can't be that many especially like for mm. big grand slams like you need to have the best people so how do they ensure because Thinking about it, there must be a strong incentive because if, if there are, the, there's so many of these like little micro calls, the best umpires in the world, they're still ultimately human. Yeah. And it's it's almost impossible to eradicate bias yeah. from completely. Yeah. So putting my like sneaky poker player hat on, like there is like there's surely an incentive to to just be friendlier with them because you just never know when it might it might count. Like again, they don't intend to be unfair but just if you have a player who's just notoriously an asshole and a player who is just notoriously a really nice guy yeah that's going to make an impact it could also work if the player is big enough like i'm thinking of nick curios as this example who's a big sort of bad boy australian very talented guy and would just always blow up at umpires I think both ends of the spectrum could actually work in your favor Mm -hmm. where if you're really nice, then they want to help you out. And if you're a real asshole, then they don't want to piss you off too much. Right. And they'd also don't want to be seen to be being then, you know, being accused of being biased against you. Because if it's like, there's this whole narrative of like, this is the bad guy to the umpires, then he can use that as a thing against you. And like, I guess, you know, a good umpire is trying to be as unbiased as possible, but there's like layers to that. And I guess that's one of the, one of the ways that, having Hawkeye and that sort of technology has cleaned things up mm. because if you think an umpire is wrong, you have a means to question and address and like, you know, fairly frequently the lines people and umpires get proved wrong with a call. Uh, do you have access to the data of, of you know, you, you can get the recording or the Hawkeye footage of your past matches and then can you use that for training essentially? That's a very recent thing, being able to access the Hawkeye footage. Um, and it's, it's sort of weird because at the challenger level, that sort of second tier of professional tennis, you can get a recording of every single match that you play. It's just, it's like the live streams are owned by the ATP. But at the tour level, because they sell TV rights to all of, all of these different uh, countries, mm. media, corporations, often you can't watch replays of your matches, which seems sort of backwards. That is weird, yeah. Yeah. It's quite frustrating, especially with doubles. Like more, uh, many more singles matches are recorded again because of that, you know, doubles has far less, less exposure. But at the same time, it, it pisses the doubles players off because it's like, well, hey, we're doing everything we can to be as professional as we can every day and we don't have access to video of matches. Like that seems like such a basic tool for improvement yeah. for professional sport. What rules of either ten, you know, the actual tennis game itself or like the meta goal, the meta rules of like the structure of, of the way the tours are set up. Would you like in an ideal world, you can make wave a magic wand. You would change to, because presumably your number one, and maybe, maybe that's not the case, but correct me if I'm not, but like your number one 
objective is to just make the game as fair as possible? Or are you optimizing for actually entertainment value so that more people just watch the sport? Um, but then depending on whatever your core objective is, would there be any rules you would change the way things are structured to, to, to make that objective more efficiently reached? I would optimize for entertainment because I think sport has to. Like it, it, ultimately, it's entertainment. And a lot of sports have a real problem where their average demographic is getting a lot older. So it's, it's much harder to bring young fans in. So I think you, you'd have to optimize for entertainment. And part of doing that in tennis, I think, is reducing the stuffiness level where you don't have to be perfectly quiet during points you know like why sh why should that be the case i mean at the us open it's it's very loud anyway because there's just a really loud buzz all the time and people are fine like it, you still play um so i think one rule i'd change that i think actually some tournaments are changing is maybe just the the small parts behind the court like the stands that are in where the ball might go during a point people can't move around during during the points but outside of that, come and go as you please. Like, I think it's a bit stupid that fans have to wait sometimes for 10, 15 minutes for a change of ends to like go and watch some tennis. Um, that's the type of thing that I'd change. I think I'd bring more music, more like atmosphere into mm. tennis tournaments. Right, because the, the aesthetic of tennis is, it's not like cool. Yeah, it's it's a bit sort of stuffy and-, and Yeah, it's just, it's got this like 1950s energy. Yeah, or something to it. Uh, I mean, it's 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 changed. To be fair, it's, I think it's become a lot more like the the players aren't just wearing white anymore. You can wear you can wear different um, colors, but like you compare it to say like something like the NBA, yeah, right, basketball. That's just it's got a very modern day aesthetic. Yeah. Um. Where, and uh, yeah, to get because I mean the attention economy is so competitive. Mm -hmm. Tennis is competing against not just other sports, but just all other forms of entertainment. And e sports now. TikTok, exactly. Yeah. Esports. Yeah. There's just so many other things. Uh, so yeah, what what other things would you do like to pull in the TikTok generation? That's a billion dollar question at the moment that I I, I know ATP is putting a lot of thought into, and I think they've they've tried to sort of reframe their marketing to be a bit edgier and like the commentators are younger and and mm. you know more people of color and all that all that sort of thing. Um, I think this like one of the issues might go back to the high barrier to entry of tennis mm. where football you know like soccer football and basketball almost anyone can play and, and it's everywhere so just need a ball and a court yeah yeah and and so you get this sort of street aspect to it which I think brings the cool so I'd, I mean Maybe I'm selling selling my sport out here, but like maybe maybe tennis doesn't have a big future. Like maybe things like pickleball, where you don't need as much space, so the the equipment's not as expensive. Like that sort of thing. Maybe they're going to take over. I mean the 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 growth and interest of something like pickleball is way faster than than with tennis. Um, so yeah, that's that's quite a cynical view on things. But just with the the dimensions of a tennis court and the rules of tennis and the way you know, the technology in tennis rackets has improved just so much and string and, and all that sort of stuff that it is going to be expensive to to get good tennis stuff, I imagine, in perpetuity. So I, I don't know how you reduce that barrier far enough that you bring sort of a street aspect into it, which I think seems to be the thing that the TikTok generation are, are most resonant with. Yeah, I mean, even things like, I wonder if there's like graphics, because one of the things that made poker pop was a showing whole cards and having those graphics on screen and like then they added layers of, of things like what are the odds you know what are the cards that this person needs right. to hit what are their current odds you know right now they're a 70 percent favorite to win oh this card now came out now they're only a 20 percent and like yeah. having data and like m moving data on screen i think again people are so we're so used to having this high dopamine uh, visual assault on everything that we look at. And easier um, access as a first time watcher as well, I imagine. Like yes. You, you don't have to deeply understand the game of poker yes. to understand the odds and like who's got the upper hand in, in a situation. Right, exactly. Yeah, I wonder if there's like some, there's some kind of like visual graphics that could be added. 
one of the most famous coaches in the world, a guy called Patrick Muradoglu, coach like Serena Williams and stuff. Uh, he has started a thing called UTS. I think it's called Ultimate Tennis Showdown. And it's taking a much more entertainment perspective on tennis where I think there's music the whole time playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there are graphics on court and they have, I haven't paid enough attention to it, but I think they have, it's not typical tennis scoring. They have like, things where you have like a hot streak so if a player wins a certain number of points in a row like points after that are w worth double or something Ooh. you know that sort of thing so i think it, he's put some effort into yeah trying to make it more exciting which yeah i, I probably need to look into that a little more mm, I, am a, I bet that will trigger the purists so oh yeah <laughs> everything triggers the purists i'd love to dig in a little bit more into the the manifestations of competition within it and particularly, you know, this channel is all about understanding what are what I call the Moloch traps, but these sort of negative spirals of competition, these races to the bottom that can emerge. Um, and then like what what can be done, whether it's top down solutions or bottom up solutions uh, to stop it from happening that way. So are there any manifestations of that that you've noticed that perhaps like driving players into you know, mental health issues or physical issues? health issues that you think just are needlessly there and need to be need to be fixed yeah i mean i think the the most obvious one that springs to mind is doping mm -hmm. like there have been tennis players caught doping and that is i think a race to the bottom of how how can i get the edge regardless of means um another one is there's a really fine line here or like a gray area here where like if you're enough of a dick to everyone then you might get an edge like you know if you're known as just being brutal and snappy and like always cutthroat rather than having the veneer of friendliness um then i see like th this is definitely a generalization but comes from many female players I speak to about this, like the, the women's side of tennis is a lot more like that, where grudges are held for a lot longer. There's a lot less of a veneer of civility and friendship. And there's more like you stick to your team, which could be your parents or your coach and like separateness. And I think it seems that on that side of the tour, there's a race to the bottom of, um, yeah, host hostility and behavior and like clashing and conflict. Right. Where does the edge come from by doing that? What's the incentive? I think it's it's an intimidation tactic of like, no, I'm not your friend. No, I'm not going to give you an inch anywhere on the court, off the court, um, that sort of thing. And like, I, I don't necessarily think that it means that you're going to have a better chance at beating someone because it, it can trigger both ways. It can trigger someone being a little more fearful of you on the tennis court, which in pressure situations gets magnified, or it can trigger this like screw you mentality that some people really thrive on. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that is, is conscious on the women's side or it's just, that's the way it's developed and that's mm. the way the tour is. But do you think it's in part, is it, could it be because of the, the prize money is less? So there's more like scarcity um, I, I mean, is it less? Last I heard it was, but I, I know they've been trying to make them more even. Well, all the Grand Slams have been even for a long time. Oh, they have? And, okay. And they're the biggest paydays for men and women. And then you have the, AT, the ATP and the WCA, the sort of men's and women's uh, governing bodies. They don't control the Grand Slams. That's a separate thing. And then they try to sell their own media rights and tickets and stuff to their own events. And the men's tour has a bigger pot than the women's tour there but they are separate entities. So right. I think it's unfair to say that men and women aren't paid the same when they're, they're governed by different entities and they're separate mm -hmm. tours. Yeah, because what, what sort of these, these Moloch situations typically have in common is they, the incentives are set up in such a way that you are pushed to do the short-term gain for lo but results in long-term pain. So like doping, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You'll get you'll get a short-term advantage. You'll build muscle mass or whatever it is faster. Um, but the long-term pain comes at, first of all, you know, your actual it hurts your body in the long run, right? To, to be doing steroids for a long time. Uh, is steroids is the usual thing people do or? Honestly, for tennis, I don't know. Cause bigger muscles doesn't necessarily right. mean 
That's, I think that's one of the good things about tennis is you could be doping all you want, but if someone's a better tennis player than you, then they're probably still going to beat you. So mm. there's like, it's like, I think it's just a stupid decision. Like there's, there's not that much to be gained from doping in tennis. And presumably tennis has a less of a problem compared to other sports when it, with, with doping. I it feels like there are some sports where it's just like, it's kind of like a, everyone agrees. Like, yeah, look, we all know everyone's at it. Whereas it doesn't seem to be the case with tennis, right? It's like, it's, it's definitely the exception. Yeah, I think so. And, and I think it's because it's skills based rather than pure physicality based. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So it's, yeah, it's less useful there. So I don't know if you saw, uh, they recently announced that Peter Thiel and some other Silicon oh, yeah. Valley people <laughs> are doing this enhanced games, uh, which I have to say, I mean, we were watching the Olympics and recently, or the last one, and, and, you know, there's so much talk about doping and so on. It's like, why don't, why doesn't someone just do like a an anything goes Olympics as a like alongside it so we can see okay this is what humans do naturally um and this is what can happen if you just take the rules away and and I I feel very torn on it because from a curiosity standpoint I want to see it like it's super interesting and I also think there's can be value that would come from actually just seeing okay what can just science unleashed combined with competition create yeah. I'm sure we'll learn a lot about the human body and there'll probably be some discoveries that are actually very beneficial for people. But it doesn't come without costs either, presumably. So I'm curious what what your take is as a just as a sports person, like you, someone who loves sport. Like, do you think that this is actually just going to be a race to the bottom or is it worth doing that experimentation? I'm, I'm a little bit torn on it because I'm similar to you in that I'm just really curious and I want to see it as a spectacle. But I, isn't this an example of a race to the bottom where health be damned, everything else be damned? I mean, I remember, I'm going to get the numbers wrong in this, but I remember hearing about a survey that was done on elite athletes and it was, the question was something like, if you could take a substance that wasn't illegal, but that would, where you, you, you knew that you would win a gold medal, but it would take 30 years off your life or something like that. Would you take it? And a huge majority said yes. Wow. And that baffled me. And it's like, like I think that that is sort of in a nutshell what's going to happen with, right. with the steroid Olympics is like people are just going to. Well, that said, though, it's a slight. It's a different game because in that high, you're talking about a gold medal, which the, the gold medals in themselves have some value. I think that me, this, this enhanced Olympics presumably won't carry, right? The, one of the reasons why, you know, a, a gold medal is so coveted is because it's, it's attached to this like institution of the Olympics that has run for, you know, 150 years or whatever. And it, it's, it's, there's so much prestige wrapped in that. I wonder whether, I would agree that the enhanced Olympics will go in that will definitely become a race to the bottom if the, the, the incentives are so huge that people are willing to sacrifice that much of themselves. But it's not clear to me that someone would make those trade-offs on something that is... Well, so it, it lacks the prestige. Yes. But it has a different sort of prestige because I'm assuming that whoever wins that whatever they're calling it, Enhanced Olympics. Yeah, I think so. Will have the world record of that thing. Right. So they will be... But it's going to have an asterisk. It's a world record asterisk. Because it's like, it's almost like this is a different species. And I think that's where I feel uneasy is, is that asterisk to me represents the race to the bottom. Right. Like, and, and, and the, the reason I'm, part of the reason I'm torn on it is because there are things that, athletes can do that are legal that have some of the same results as taking steroids for example like Novak Djokovic used to I'm not sure if he does travel with a um an oxygen chamber to tournament so he slept in it and it I'm probably getting this wrong I think it increased his white blood cell count red blood cells red blood cells yeah. which was the same as doing EPO or something like like some sort of steroid oh really for recovery and he has had just ridiculous feats of recovery in his career that I can't explain away any other way than like oxygen tent mm. and some advantage over other humans because I thought it was physically impossible. 
But that's within the rules. It's within the rules. But it's ex- exactly the same result as injecting yourself with, with whatever steroid it was. Right. And only the wealthiest 20 tennis players in the world could travel with an oxygen tent and like take it around everywhere because it's just expensive. So like that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, but it feels ick. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel you. I definitely feel you. Like it's, I guess we need to just pin down exactly what makes something a race to the top versus a race to the bottom. If, it, I guess it comes down to just like externalities. If the, you know, in a thousand years time, we look back at the enhanced Olympics and it has uncovered the secrets to longevity or the secrets mm-hmm. to, to healing, recovery, someone who gets an injury actually can inject stem cells mm-hmm. and something that was previously not allowed. And actually now like we can just heal injuries really, really fast. Like health span to 150 or whatever. Exactly. Like then we would all look back at it and go, okay, yes, that was actually a race to the top, even though there were some temporary races yeah. to the bottom where actually some people died because they were doing this and so on. Um, but, or, or it could be in a thousand years time, we look back and it's just like, we've lost we've lost what it means to actually just have fair competition. Like we, 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 we've lost the ability to design games in the first place where it's like, everyone agrees this is a fair thing or, or. Yeah. It's that word fair that is so interesting and, and that's the lever, right? Yeah. But at the same time, we don't know until we find out. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really unclear to me. I think all in all, like one of my core philosophies I got from this little book called, um, an imminent metaphysics by Forrest Landry. And he has this line in it, which is love is that which enables choice as a, like a core aphorism, a core truth about reality. If you were to wow. have an ethical truth and I, I overall something that increases people's ability to do choice is generally a good thing. Now, again, race to the top is if, 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 if the externalities of, of something like the enhanced Olympics is all, um, increased longevity, health span, et cetera, et cetera. That is a choice making thing because you're giving people basically more agency over themselves to have a longer life and doing all the things they want to do. But if it was a race to the bottom where actually everyone ends up more like, like cracked out unhealthy people, now you're taking away their choice. Yeah. So, but that said, n- preventing the world from doing the experiment in the first place is, is a reduction of choice. So on, on that piece, I had a fascinating conversation with a weightlifter at the Rio Olympics, a, a Kiwi guy, where my favorite thing about the Olympics is just talking to people about their sport because you learn more in five minutes of talking to someone who's a master than you could from watching two hours of TV. Um, and the thing that I remember vividly from this conversation was he said in, that, in the weight class that he was in, uh, in the competition, everyone in that weight class knew who was doing roids and who wasn't. Mm. And the people who were doping were going to win. They were going to get the medals. And so within their weight class, they had a separate competition amongst themselves where they, as a group, were keeping track of who was lifting what and it was like a pride thing among them. Among them. And that was what they went to the Olympics for. They knew they weren't going to medal because they knew that, well, that they strongly believed that that there were people who they couldn't fairly compete against so they they did this sort of secondary competition which sucks like if you're going to the olympics yeah. with the knowledge that you it's not a fair match it's not a fair yeah, game yeah. yeah so i guess like one thing that the enhanced olympics would enable is or i guess in the best case those two competitions would be split fairly Right. And that's the thing, isn't it? Now those people who just couldn't resist, you know, those people who were cheating in that weightlifting class, like they just couldn't resist doing the doping. Now they've got an opportunity to actually go into something where they can lean into that more. Would that mean that they would essentially out themselves Mm, officially? That's what I'm wondering. And so now they just won't take part in the normal Olympics anymore. So you kind of just dangle the carrot for the, for those people and they go and do that. I don't know. Like at the same time, it's going to take a while for the prestige to, to, to start to catch up with the real Olympics. I think until you get the prestiges at the similar level, yeah. that's not going to be a sufficient incentive. What are your thoughts on the, because it seems like the payout structures in tennis are very top heavy. Do you think there's room for optimization there to, to give, because as you mentioned before, like, is it a meritocracy? Yes, it is, but with an asterisk, right? Like there's a lot of, 
did you have a wealthy family growing up? Did you, or did you get lucky? Are, are you hot, right? If you're, if you're yeah. very attractive, you can get sponsorship deals. You're going to stand out more. Or do you look different? Or are you, you know, are you high on the charisma? Like there are certain things like that, which um, makes it seemingly less meritocracy about the game itself. Yeah. So would, would differing the payout structures help with that? Yeah, yeah. I, I have very strong and very biased opinions on this, being a, you know, a doubles player who highest ranking was 30 something. I think tennis being one of the biggest sports in the world, like in terms of global followings, I think the 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 how steep the pyramid is in terms of who can make a living from tennis is ludicrous. If you compare it to any major team sport so to, to give a bit of context on the men's side of tennis which is the only one i can i can speak to with any real knowledge uh there are probably 200 people in the world who make a reasonable living from playing tennis and i'd say 80 to 100 who make a good living and that's like two nfl teams and and this this it's sport crazy. It, it, it is a bit crazy and and the amount of sacrifice that goes into a tennis career i think is bigger than i'm going to get a lot of people offside here but i think it's bigger than any team sport because in order to have a successful tennis career you not only have to have all of the sports skills and ability and talent and determination and work ethic and all that sort of stuff you have to organize your whole life alongside that so in a team You'll have your accommodation organized, your flights organized, your training organized. You show up, you do your training, you show up, you, you play the game, and then you go into recovery that's all organized. In tennis, if you're not already at the top and so have the, the money to have a travel agent and a manager and an agent, all that, all that sort of stuff, like my whole career, I've been my own travel agent, booked my own hotels, organized my own schedule, um, organized my own trainings. And so you've got this whole other sphere of things that that you have to be able to do um and yeah i mean I, I could rant on this for a long time the bottom line for me is that i think a lot more tennis players should be able to make a living from playing professional tennis than do currently i don't know what the best mechanism for that is because it is a reality that the very top players put the most bums on seats and i think there's legitimacy in saying okay if tennis is, a, is an entertainment business, then the people who entertain the most should get paid by far the most. And again, I think it goes back to this chicken egg situation of maybe you need to tell the stories better of the people you know closer to 100 in the world who still play incredible tennis, who if they turned up at any random town, people would be like, oh my God, who is this person? You're a god. Yes. But uh, because because they're relatively unknown they you know they don't get the sponsorship deals and all that sort of stuff so presumably the game like th these are the people who enable the game to exist if you if they suddenly dropped out because they just can't afford to travel to the game so they it's just unsustainable yeah. then the whole house of cards would collapse the other thing that i think is very unfair is as a percentage of revenue players get something it, it's different between grand slams and, and the tour but it's it's historically been something from like 12 percent to 20 percent of total revenue and you know there are massive strikes in the states if teams are getting less than 50 percent if, mm. if athletes are getting less than 50 percent like if if baseball players are getting less than 50 percent they just don't play until their union agrees but tennis has a disadvantage compared to all those sports because we're international so we can't unionize we like there's very little sort of legal pressure that you can you can apply. And actually, an interesting relation to, to the whole idea of Moloch, like it is a little bit of a race to the bottom because if the top 50 players said, hey, this isn't fair, we're going to make a stand and boycott tournaments to, to get a higher percentage of revenue, then the 100 players below them would be like, oh my God, I'm going to play Wimbledon without like, Novak Djokovic and the top 50 players playing it could be, be my one chance ever mm -hmm. to win Wimbledon so you'll just get replaced and you know right. the story keeps rolling right there's no way in the modern digital age I wonder if there is some kind of 
Because that's what you need, basically. You need a coordination mechanism. If if you think that it actually, I mean, are you an are you an outlier in your in your opinion on this, or do you think most? Definitely not. Definitely not an outlier. And and one example is actually Live Golf, compared to the PGA Tour. So a serious competitor came up, and with serious money, like you know, like um, oil money, basically. And now, after a whole lot of drama, um, they have merged somewhat. Um, maybe tennis needs that. Mm. A, a serious competitor to say, we're going to offer your your talent better. So unless you meet them where, they, where they're going to get that offer, then you're going to lose them. What would it take to start that? Could you? A lot of money. <laughs> A lot of money, I think, is the answer. Like, right. you know, li- I, the contracts that Liv were, were offering was, I think Tiger <coughs> Tiger Woods got offered like a billion dollars or something. Mm. Like serious money. Um, again, because of the prestige thing. I mean, do you think it's something that just a few really big names made us think about? Could that be sufficient? Because I guess the thing is the incentive, they're the ones who are getting all the money at the top, mm. right? But could they be convinced, you know, could you convince a Djokovic or, or a, I don't know who the best woman is right now, actually, but convince them that, look, look this is just unsustainable. And it, the, you know, it's, like, it's, 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 it's analogous to the wealth inequality problem that yeah. we're, we're talking about, right? Wealth inequality has not been higher in a long time than it currently is right now. Um, and it's, it's such a difficult trade-off because meritocracy is super important, but at the same time, if, if if the if the the trends are becoming unsustainable and if people yeah if if the game becomes unsustainable because you can't just people coming in they just can't make it or again like like if the barriers to entry are too high and you yeah. don't have the the capture of a, a wide pool then the quality drops right and, and then actually the quality of the tennis drops and yeah. people don't want to watch it as much yeah um, and I think audiences are refined enough to notice that the quality of tennis has dropped. Yeah. I mean, so th- there has been a bit of a movement in this direction um, in the last few years. There was a thing created called the PTPA, which was led by Novak Djokovic and, and a guy called Vashit Posh Basil, um, basically trying to do things differently to the ATP. And I was hearing rumors that... Um, Getting the guy's name. He's a hedge fund billionaire, Bill uh, Ackman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was thinking about f- funding a tour, but I think it would take lots of Bill Ackmans to to make it juicy enough to attract people away. I'm not sure what what's happened to it in the meantime, but there has been interest. Um, yeah, this is this is the prestige piece that I find interesting because you know, like in golf, they've they've managed to do it even even though they've They've got the majors and tennis, the Grand Slams are sort of the be all end all. Of, mm. yeah. So one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here, aside of obviously like there's so much, so many overlaps between tennis and poker and the, the these Moloch problems. It's interesting that they are also arising in tennis, but you have started arguably one of the most win-win organizations I can think of, which is High Impact Athletes. Could you explain what High Impact Athletes does and what motivated you to start it? Sure. So at its most basic, High Impact Athletes connects elite, usually professional athletes with the world's best charities, the world's most cost-effective, most impactful charities. Um, But I think it goes far beyond that. Uh, For better or worse, athletes have a huge amount of influence in society. Um, you know, that's always, it's always a little bit surprising to me that athletes are listened to on things outside of like running fast or chasing a ball or whatever, but that is the case. And what that means is that ideally we can use athletes, uh, to use a crass way of putting it, but use them as levers to spread really good ideas. So if, if an athlete has millions of followers and an athlete believes in giving back and an athlete believes in giving back really effectively, and communicates that that idea to the followers, then you know, ideally, a percentage of those followers start thinking more deeply about the way that they do charity, and the cost effectiveness of the charities that they've given to, or maybe just gets inspired to give for the first time in their life. Right. Um, so my my goal with high impact athletes is to create 
a really large and vibrant and influential community of professional athletes who make giving effectively a real norm in the athlete space and then from there it filters out into into society because i mean i'm definitely in an echo chamber but sport is just huge and it and it penetrates so many different strata of of society like you you know you, you can be in any job at at any at any level and still be a big sport fan and and still be swayed by what your favorite athletes or what your favorite teams do how do you select your charities like what are these what are what are sort of the core ideas that that thread them together i mean the core idea is cost effectiveness um so in some ways we had to narrow down initially um I had a, a huge, basically every charity that was recommended by three or four different research organizations I had on HIA's page as, as recommendations for athletes. And um, the more I got to know athletes, the more I realized that if they're confronted with too much information, they run as fast as they can in the other direction, <laughs> speaking generally, of course. Um, so what I ended up doing was taking three cause areas, global health and wellbeing, climate change and animal welfare and trying to create a condensed list of the most highly recommended charities. So for example, on the human side, uh, two of the most highly recommended charities are Against Malaria Foundation and Malaria Consortium that both fight the disease of malaria, but do it in slightly different ways. But so instead of giving both options to the athletes, I just have one option for malaria and for example, one option for vitamin A supplementation. So. I'm still trying to give options, but make it less scary when you're first confronted with the list. Right, sort of streamline it a little bit. How do you choose within those, you, if you say you've got three charities in the global health bucket, uh, is that sort of then, is it a third each or how do you vary that? So athletes can choose to donate to a specific charity. Like we, we, we try not to be prescriptive at all with, with what athletes do. We just say, hey, here's the research, here are the research organizations, all of it's publicly available. These are the things that they've recommended, this is why. Now, if something re resonates with you and you choose from this list, you can be sure that this is basically the highest impact donation that you can make. And I think that's actually, I think part of the reason why we've grown quickly is twofold one is athletes and i think this probably applies to any public figures firstly they're they're time poor they, they don't want to spend the time researching charities secondly they don't want to be caught in a gotcha moment where you know we've all seen the stories of scandals celebrities put their name to a charity and then it turns out that the charity was like either siphoning off the money yeah. or the thing like the, the 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 play plumps play plumps one is always a good example of it right yes yeah. it got like tens of millions for these spinning uh merry-go-rounds it was an idea of like oh people in villages need to pump water but and the kids have energy so if we just make the pump be this circular merry-go-round and the kids will push it and the moms don't have to do all this annoying pumping but then it turns out that physics is real <laughs> <laughs> and actually the amount of energy it takes to push one of these things is huge and it was not fun for the kids it didn't actually spin um, but like Clinton and Jay-Z and a bunch of people will like attach their name to it. And then it was like tens or even hundreds of millions were wasted on the, on this project. So it was, and then the women had to actually use these merry-go-rounds to get water. Whereas before they could just do this pump and it was really demeaning and it was just a huge yeah. catastrophe. So and presumably it, that's what, you, yeah, you're trying to avoid. it's still going. Wait, it's, no. It's still a charity. Stop it. And it it's has funding. So, so that's the, that what? Is, Cause I give that as an example in talks when I talk about a charity effectiveness of just like, this is what not to do. Yeah. Or like another example I love is one called scared straight where the idea, which is, sounds like a really cool idea is take young juvenile offenders into prisons to scare them straight. Hear the stories from, from inmates who have made wrong des decisions and ended up in jail. And then eventually someone did a study on the long-term effects. The people who went through the program were more likely to end up in jail than the ones who didn't because they thought that the stories from the inmates were cool. So like those are the, the, I mean, those are extreme examples, right? And I like to think that the majority of charities aren't like actively harmful to the, the people or the things that they're trying to improve. But the reality is that like any area of life, charity is a very wide spectrum where you have literally harmful to incredibly impactful and cost-effective and, and incredibly positive. 
and we only work with the charities that through the most rigorous research available at the moment have been proven to be in that area and that are as an as an absolute baseline transparent with their books and going back to the the gotcha moment i think that's part of why we've grown quickly is because athletes can at least say okay well if things are transparent then i can be sure that i'm not going to get screwed around Mm. and then i think the other aspect is where we were started by athletes I think like 80% of our team are either current or ex-athletes. So there's a level of peers approaching each other about something that, you know, like I've I've personally been doing for, I don't know, I guess it's like eight years now is like giving to these charities. And so it's not a, hey, you should do this. It's like, hey, I really believe in this. This is what I'm doing. I'd love for you to join me and join this community that now is over 200 athletes strong. Is there like a minimum percentage of donation that you expect the athletes to do of the, of the of the income or how does it work? Again, we try not to be prescriptive. What we urge people towards is what we call the pledge, which is 2% of annual earnings. And, you know, we have, uh, I think about 35% of our athletes are on a pledge of 2% or more. Um, then we have the bulk are on uh, what we call donors, which is they donate as much as they feel is comfortable for them at the end of each year or, or on a recurring plan. And then we do have a, a small percentage who are still what we call supporters where they want to use their voice to speak about it. And I think actually one misconception that a lot of people have about athletes is if you're a professional athlete, then you're earning tons of money. The reality is for, I want to say 90, 95% of professional athletes they don't earn much at all. Like mm. team sports in the States, great. You're earning really well. A lot of Olympic athletes in most countries are basically on a living wage. So donation might not feel super comfortable, but what most athletes have, even if they don't have the financial wealth, is influence and an audience and a voice that they can use to, yeah. to spread good ideas. So we're trying to do both at the same time. Like I think a message is a lot more powerful if you have your money where your mouth is. So again, it's the... I'm doing this, I'd love for you all to join me rather than, um, you know, like, hey, go go do this thing. Um, so yeah, we, we urge athletes at the very least to have some money towards these these charities, some, some donation. Um, but if it's not right for them at their age and stage, then that's not, that doesn't pr- preclude them from being part of the community. Mm. A lot of pushback I often hear of people in general when they hear about philanthropy is it's like, oh, well, these are problems that can they should you know why why uh, why do these problems exist that they have to rely on handouts essentially to solve them and it always frustrates me a little bit because ultimately i i think charity exists in the gaps that both taxes and the market fail to capture uh there's you know Yes, malaria probably could have been eradicated. It was effectively eradicated a long time ago, but for some reason it didn't. And that's because it wasn't, it somehow capitalism did not, it, it just it slipped through the net of capitalism. Mm. Similarly, the, the places where it takes place, the governments there don't have the effectiveness with deploying their taxes to, to resolve them. So the, that leaves this gap and that's where you just have to rely on handouts. Mm. But yeah, why do you think it is that people have, they sort of use, is it like an excuse that, that people sort of often turn their nose up at philanthropy as an idea? Or what do you think it is? I think it's a couple of things. On one side, I think because of the, you know, it's like the loud minority of, of scandals, mm. colour people's opinion of, of charity as a whole, which is really, really unfortunate. And then the other side that, popped into my head when you were saying that was I think it might be a little bit like veganism or vegetarianism where like it, it people get defensive yeah. around it if they're if they're not giving and so if someone talks about their philanthropy they're like you know like come on what are you doing what are you really doing type thing which doesn't need to be the case but I think that's this human defensiveness yeah I mean it, it makes sense um in terms of you know if you're feeling a kind of because yeah if someone mentions oh I give 20% of my income away to charity. And I'm like, well, I'm like, oh shit, I maybe give some away every year or like, but it's never more than like one or 2%. Mm. Then you naturally f- start to sort of feel judged. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even so if that's not the intention. No, of course not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not the intention at all. And it is. So 
when we ran Raising for Effective Giving, me and Eagle, which is in many ways very similar to HIA in, in, in terms of the model, um, that was often the sort of pushback we'd hear is like, well, I want to do charity, but I don't want to talk about it. And I, I get it. Like it, it, it's, it's, it can come across as being kind of moralizing in some ways. I started donating. I discovered the ideas of giving effectively in uh, I think 2014 or 2015. Made a donation that year, made a 1% pledge the following year, upped that pledge as I went and felt really good about it. Like, you know, you mentioned the win-win. For me, this was a way that I could still be somewhat of an asshole on a tennis court, like a killer on a tennis court. But if I did well, it meant that the world did well. And, you know, a, a very powerful rationalization for me was, yes, I'm taking food off my opponent's dinner plate, but the people I'm giving it to need it way, way more. Mm. So that was actually, a, a it, it made me feel so much better about my tennis career. So that, that was amazing. And then it got to 2020. And I think at the start of 2020, I'd, up to my percentage pledge like eight percent or something and felt good about it it felt i didn't feel like i could do any more at that stage and then COVID hit and tour stopped and for the first time in my adult life didn't really have anything to do like didn't have anyone to train with i was in connecticut with my in-laws um being really careful because her, her, her parents uh, were being careful so didn't have anyone to train with and got very bored and started just thinking more about my place in the world and like started thinking am I actually maximizing my impact in the world and what I realized was I'd been giving for however many years like five, five six years and I'd never spoken about it publicly mm. and I think this may, may have started in the UK but in New Zealand it's it's very prevalent this idea of tall poppy syndrome very prevalent in the UK as yeah, well. Like you, you just you don't poke your head above the parapet because you get cut you down. You don't boast. You don't boast. Exactly. It was, I remember like very drilled into me in my family. It just it, it's part of the culture. Like you never ever boast. Well, if you talk about a thing that you do that you believe that you are doing that you believe is good, that you know you are the best at something or you're doing something that you just really really believe in, it's there's such a fine line between talking about it and it immediately falling into boasting. Like yeah. their threshold for calling it boasting is, is, is too low, and I society think. society being like, oh, hold yes. on a second there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I have a healthy dose of that coming from New Zealand. And so that was what was holding me back from talking about it. The painful realization during COVID was, especially because like I don't have a big profile, but I've got something of a profile in New Zealand. The realization was by me not having spoken about it, I might have left some serious impact on the table. And because mm -hmm. these charities that I'm giving to are so cost effective and so impactful, it could be the difference between like someone living or dying. Mm. And, and that was like, oh, whoa, okay, I need to do something about being an advocate for these ideas. Cause I, I believe in them deeply enough and powerfully enough to like, you know, give a significant percentage of, of my income. So that was, the, that was the conception or that was the moment that I was like, okay, I need to do something and then looking looking into what I could do that's when I found raising for effective giving and that was like oh maybe maybe this needs to go into the athlete world and I put out I put out a forum post on on the the, the EA forums or like basically just sent a message out into the world like hey are there any professional athletes interested in giving effectively and it was cricket I was like okay well, shit I guess I have to do it um and then that was like a okay, high impact athletes born and man it's been yeah it's been a Really cool ride since then. Yeah, you've got 180 athletes now from 31 countries, 40 different sports. I think, um, yeah, I think even even more than that now. I think there's probably probably over 200 athletes and I think it's close to 50 sports in like 35 countries or something now. And how much that, money have you moved? This past year, we, we moved like 470,000. Awesome. Which is good, but it's very much just the start. And like... The potential that I see for this, like this year we're, we're aiming for a, a million minimum and I want to be doing a lot more than that a few years down the line. Well, if any professional athletes are watching this, then consider high impact <laughs> athletes. I mean, again, it's coming back to this idea of like the, the, the sort of income inequality in tennis. If you could get just one really big 
household tennis name, uh, the, the the trickle effect, the trickle down yeah. effect from that would be just enormous. Not only because of their giving power, but again, the like the the infectiousness of it. So I'm I'm interviewing Te, uh, Chris Anderson, the founder of TED, oh, cool. uh, in on Monday, and he's just written a book called Infectious Generosity, which is just again talk about win win. It's like literally like how can we harness the power of virality, which is usually used for sort of either neutral or, or negative things typically more because our emotions tend to react more strongly to negative stuff than or like we our, our, our limbic systems react more strongly to negative stuff than like nice happy things mm -hmm. um, and so that's why negativity seems to go viral more rapidly than positivity but he's like is there a way we can incentivize things so that we can harness the power of virality for good yeah and i think this is an exact example of that again like talk, that's one of the reasons why you actually should talk about when you do something philanthrop philanthropic so when you do something good be proud of it and talk about it create because that's creating a race to the top yeah it's like can, I, yeah. can do i mean I, i'm sure there's ways where it can go down a, down a hill but if if, I, if someone gets defensive about something well okay some people might like dig in their heels and try and attack it but a lot of people will be like well i don't want to be out outdone by them so you can have mm -hmm. a keeping up with the joneses but in in a very like with very positive externalities yeah that's that's something where uh, to me that's like the beautiful end point if we if hia does our job well so one cool thing that's happened really recently um i'm not sure he's quite at the stage of household name but probably our biggest tennis player is a guy called stefano Sitsipas, who's getting pretty big he's number yeah, three right he was number three he he made finals at Australian Open last year and went out in the quarters or something this year. So he's dropped, I think he might be like number nine or 10 now, but extremely successful tennis player. And he uh, just last week or the week before agreed to, he's, he's going to donate a thousand bucks for every set that he wins this year, which will be, well, last year he won something like 110 sets. Oh, wow. The year. So that sort of thing, right? If, if it's, something that his fans can get engaged with because they like Steph, they follow Steph, they like it when he wins. Mm. If he's doing something positive for every time he has success and then the call to action for the fans can be, hey, join Steph, Steph and donate like a dollar or 50 cents and the guy has a following of I don't know how many millions, then if only a small percentage of his following takes action on like following Steph and supporting his charitable journey, then the numbers start getting really meaningful. Mm. And then where I start getting really excited is, you know, setting up a competition between athletes being like, okay, well, screw you. I'm going to see if my fan base can like do, you know, like getting the gamifying and making competitive the, the philanthropic space. And then on the flip side of that, an, an idea that um, Cam, our, our director of comms had recently that I think, has real potential if done well is in especially it seems in team sports fans love jumping on big athletes when they're not playing well and his idea was to like have a campaign around cold streaks so Ooh. like and having it to do with climate so like <laughs> so like fans can can donate for every shot that Steph Curry misses or or something like that and i think there's something psychological I love that, it yeah yes where, it, where it's like celebrating your least favorite team's best players misses and being like haha you missed but still doing something positive from it exactly it's combining again it's like shit talking you yeah know? you know, I love language is shit talking and we found a way to extract value out of this like seemingly negative thing um yeah it's if these things are done with like a sufficient lightheartedness yeah. Um, or even if they're not, if the impact is so good, if it generally if it creates like two million counterfactual dollars to highly effective charities, even if it creates a bunch of negativity, it's probably worth it. I don't know. It's difficult. To Have you heard of defeat by tweet? No. That's I, so. This is genius, and it's sort of the the model that inspired us. So, an organization called M Momentum created this thing where you could sign up so that you'd donate a small amount automatically every time Donald Trump tweeted. So like you you could choose, there was a bunch of uh, organizations, it was like the ACLU, basically things that were like in direct opposition to, to Trump's philosophies. And so it was hilarious because, you know, like Trump sends out a tweet and if you don't like the guy, then you like, you see the tweet and you're like, ha ha. And you I get just, to do that. Yeah, and you, and you do something that you believe is positive out of it. Like I, I just, 
the virality of an idea like that, if we can tap into that in the sport space, I just, I think that's got unlimited potential. Random question. What's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? I think this might be a boring answer, but I don't think I've ever given my mother enough credit or gratitude for the amount of time that she spent with me as a kid, especially around tennis. Like, it must have been so annoying. Like, every holiday, every summer weekend, I couldn't get myself around, so she'd, like, drive to tennis tournaments and sit there and, like, force-feed me bananas. And, um, and I think you take it for granted when you're a kid because you don't know any different and it's your mum. Uh, but looking back on it, like, a huge time sacrifice. And, um, yeah, I probably, I, I don't think I've probably thanked her meaningfully enough for that. Yeah, mums rarely get enough credit. Mm. And yet they're also the people who, in many ways, least expect it or something. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I hope, like, she's a way bigger tennis fan than I am. Um, so I, I hope... I hope like the experiences that we've had together, especially like, you know, now that I've had a, a reasonably successful career, I hope she's felt like it was worth it. Oh yeah. Cause if she loves it, I mean, she gets to come on tour and just meet all the people, see them all, see, yeah. see behind the scenes. Yeah. That must be, was she yeah. a tennis player herself? Uh, yeah, not, not to a high level, like, like at a regional level in New Zealand. Um, her and dad still play like, yeah, still, still get out there quite often, actually, in, in summer. And they, Are they competitive they with each other? Uh, I think they used to be. I think they've, they've had enough years married now that they've realized it probably wasn't positive for their relationship. Oh, interesting. Um, but they're both actually very competitive. Mum is actually one of the most competitive people I've ever come across, to the extent that she struggles to not cheat in board games. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's, it's a little bit scary. But, um, yeah, so... She tries to pretend like she's not competitive on a tennis court, but she's she's feisty. What's the proudest moment of your career? Winning an Olympic medal, hands down. It must be unfathomable. What did it feel like to actually just stand on the podium? By the time we got on the podium, I was like numb because cause we, we won the match that won our medal and and then it was like two hours before we got on the podium. Like the, I think the, the gold-silver match had to play. Um, so by then I was, yeah, I think I just felt too much at the time. Like I, I was just a wreck and I think part of it was that was, that was during COVID and being from New Zealand, it was amazing if you were in New Zealand cause there wasn't really COVID in New Zealand and okay, you did lockdowns for a while, but outside of that, it was like life is normal. If you were a Kiwi who was outside New Zealand during that time, you couldn't get back. So, well, you, you were very lucky if you managed to get back. Right. And I didn't get lucky. So I was on tour from hotel to hotel to hotel for, I don't know, 20, 20 months. Like, like it was a long time and I was exhausted and so burnt out. And I remember about a month before the Olympics, a guy I'd been playing with for a long time told me he wanted to split after the grass court season, which was like the last series of tournaments before the Olympics. And I was already in a pretty bad place mentally from just being like away from home for so long and, and burnt out. And that was sort of the final straw. And I just like, I don't think I'm naturally prone to depression, but there have been periods in my life where, where I, I feel like that's my experience of it. And this was like a pretty prolonged period of, not being able to find any meaning in anything I was doing. Like we actually had some pretty good results during that time. Didn't feel anything. Hmm. And, and then, so we got to about a week before I had to fly over to Tokyo for the Olympics. And I knew that I was in a really bad way. And playing for New Zealand means more to me than anything. Like it's, it's just far more special than playing individually. And so what I did was that week I went to my parents-in-law's place in Connecticut, which is sort of quite rural, put my tennis bag in the back of the closet and just didn't look at it for a week to try to 
shake my mind out of this darkness. And I don't think I was successful, but at least I had a bit of a reprieve from the like constant punch in the face of being another tournament on tour. So I arrived in Tokyo in a, in a bad place mentally, did quite a lot of work with amazing guy there, Jason McKenzie, like a, a, a mental skills guy to basically just saying, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not in a great space, but this is so important to me. What can we do? And so this this is a very long-winded way of saying the two weeks that I was at the Olympics, I was like, I was putting so much energy into compressing and bottling this pretty intense darkness into a place in my mind where it wouldn't affect tennis. And then after that bronze medal match, when the 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 mission was over it all just like flooded out and so that that like flood of emotion along with the fact that something good had come of it like something that uh, you know for me was just like top of the mountain was just so overwhelming mm. it was like yeah it was the weirdest mi- mix of emotion like relief and grief and like yeah, I can't, I can't even explain it. Like I get sort of emotional talking about it yeah. now where I was just a sobbing wreck for like 20 minutes and my asshole partner was just like, <laughs> he didn't cry once. He was laughing at me. And <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's that's probably the biggest reason why I wanted to play one more year on tour was because I just really want to have that Olympic experience again and be part of the New Zealand team and like feel the country coming together and like being part of something bigger like that so So. what's what's your plan it's in five months yeah yeah four and a bit months i think late july so what 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 does your schedule look like between now and then in the run-up i'm trying to play bigger events to play better opponents and so that that will include things like ideally um acapulco uh, at the end of this month in, in mexico uh there's a big tournament in miami in march um then over to europe hopefully playing some of the Masters on clay, French Open, and then a few grass court tournaments in Wimbledon before the Olympics. I've never been in this position before where I've been injured for a long time. So it's, yeah, I'm sort of trying to figure it out as I go. What's next for you after tennis? The immediate answer is high impact athletes. Like it's it's been, it it was amazing having that to turn to while I was injured. I think if I didn't have that, I would have Mm. really struggled with being on crutches and, you know, like, Two years is a long time to, to be away from something that you've d- done your whole life. Um, but high, inf- high impact athletes made that not just manageable, but exciting. Like I'm, I'm really passionate about what we're trying to build and I think the potential is huge. And so it gave me something to wake up for in the morning and like, you know, even, even feel a little bit competitive about like, okay, what's, what's currently the best organization and the athlete times charity space what are their pros and cons? Is there something that we can do better with them that you know maybe we can get athletes to have more of an impact in the world, like that sort of thing, that gets me going. Um, so my 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 dream is to build high impact athletes into into something that is so big and so normal for professional athletes that it doesn't need to exist anymore. Like if the the dream is like. That, that giving effectively is such an integral part of being a professional athlete that you don't even really have to mention it anymore. And, and kids who grow up watching their athlete idols, like their careers and watching them on screen are like, okay, I want to play sport like this person. And part of like playing sport like, like this person and having their lifestyle is just giving back in a really meaningful, effective way. That's, that's the moonshot. I'm not sure that I could build HIA to that, but like if I can build HIA to a size and a scale where it makes the most sense for someone else to more experienced than me to like take the reins and take it further, then that's sort of my medium term plan. And after that, who knows. So there we are, folks. Huge thank you to everyone for tuning in. And of course to Marcus, it's really got me thinking about just how we can harness the power of competition itself for directly positive things. Do make sure you give him a follow. I've linked to his social media below. And also check out High Impact Athletes, his his movement. It's such 
a great idea of a way to turn zero-sum games into clearly positive-sum win-win movements. And as always, if you enjoyed this, make sure to subscribe and tell your friends. All right. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.